Okay, so number two is about the grasslands and the Eurasian steppe. So here, uh, Fernandez Amisto talks about the uncultivable grasslands and the Eurasian steppe. And I spoke a little bit about the Eurasian steppe in the previous episode. So the great grasslands of the world uh, include uh, the Eurasian steppe all the way from Manchuria to the western shore of the Black Sea, the great North American plain between the Rocky Mountains and the Mississippi Valley and the Great Lakes, and the North African savannah and Sahel, which is that sort of strip up the top of it above the Sahara Desert. Um, and these environments have been full of grass, I guess. Uh, and some of those grasses like wheat and rye and whatnot have, have uh, been converted into the traditional traditional cultivable plants of civilizations, cradles of civilizations. But on the whole, the grasses, the native grasses of these um, grasslands are not so great for human food. But what they have uh, attracted are the big, uh, like the bison and the other, uh, the horses and the um, uh, other kind of uh, grazing animals that have been hunted and herded by the peoples of these areas. And these grasslands are not without variety, of course. Um, there is great, great diversity in little microclimates and little ecological niches and, and whatnot within the vast land. It's not the endless step of uh, cliché, uh, particularly so perhaps in Africa. But it is to the great Eurasian step that I'm going to turn for my uh, little example of uh, a civilization based in this kind of uh, this this kind of environment. And the Eurasian step, uh, Fernandez Amesto introduces as the wastes of Gog. Uh, Gog and Romance, Gog and Magog being the, I think, Greek kind of story, uh, in the Greek story, the guards of uh, the ends of the world, they were, they sort of guarded uh, the gates of Europe, so to speak, in the Carpathian Mountains. Gog and Magog, I think, are, are shown in the, one of the arcades in Collins Street, Melbourne. But uh, according to the story, they were guarding the entry to the great Pontic Caspian steppe that stretched from Hungary through to Central Asia and in on to Manchuria. And this step has attracted much cultural commentary, especially like I guess in Russian culture, because really uh, Russia straddles the steppe and the taiga or in the Russian world, especially if one uh, includes the, the various former Soviet uh, republics as well, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, etc., etc. Uh, Soviet republics or, or Russian imperial uh, provinces. It can be a landscape of wind and apparent endless open sky. Uh, and it's evoked all sorts of uh, descriptions as such. So for example, there was a German traveler in the 19th century, uh, J. G. Cole, who described the steppe as a land of movement, whose law is movement, whose soil abhors deep-rooted plants, favouring instead mobile cattle breeding, whose winds carry everything before them far and wide, and whose flatness invites everything to cross it in haste. This is the terrain uh, that uh, Barry Cunliffe, the archaeologist, describes as the greatest natural corridor on earth 
and that Felipe Fernandez Amesto describes as the highway of civilizations. So much has travelled over here, and uh, the much, much uh, debated territory of Ukraine is indeed on the great Eurasian steppe, the Pontic Caspian uh, steppe, uh, and you know, there are many descriptions from previous times of peoples who have lived and adapted and travelled uh, across Ukraine and the broader Eurasian steppe. Of course, famously the steppe, uh, I think I might have mentioned uh, in the previous episode, was the home of uh, nomadic cavalry and the birth of horse riding and indeed the domestication of the horse so fundamental to them but there were also forms of quite sophisticated cultures that developed sophisticated and uh, artistically wondrous cultures that developed including those known by ancient greek writers as the Scythians or Scythians and the Samasians, S-C-Y-T-H-I-A-N-S and the Samasians, S-A-M-A-R-T-I-A-N-S. Fernandez Semesto says that the demanding environment of the steppe, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's winds, it's flatness, it's sun, it's uh, shifts of hot and cold. Uh, perhaps because of the demanding environment and the competitive violent way of life, this was also a region of impressive and precocious technical developments. And hence we have the domestication of horses, the development of covered wagons, the horse riding, the, the stirrup, the, cav the um, cavalry. But we also have remarkable and beautiful uh, ironwork and jewel work and gold work, particularly by the uh, Scythians or Scythians. Uh, and the uh, Scythians were horse riders, uh, they were famous fighters but they also were in regular trade with the Greek craftsmen and many of them were based around the uh, Sea of Azov and the north part of the Black Sea where there is, um, you know, currently fighting going on between uh, Russia and Ukraine. In the, this is in the era of first millennium, second half of the first millennium BC, so for say 500, BC through to um, those sites around the north of the Black Sea have found uh, really quite significant and impressive and quite beautiful gold objects. Um, I guess, what would you call them? Plaques and plates and jewellery. Quite exquisite, exquisite representations of humans and horses and trees and whatnot really quite beautiful if you uh, kind of check them out and it was uh, although some of those findings have been in southern Ukraine and although times Ukraine has claimed I guess the Scythians as their own it's generally thought that the home base so to speak of the Scythians was really uh, southern Siberia and that they extended out um, from uh, around about 900 BC to 200 BC all the way uh, westward uh, across Central Asia into the northern Black Sea and in the Hermitage Museum in uh, St. Petersburg you can go and actually visit some of and look at some of the extraordinary extraordinary artwork that is uh, that has survived around the Scythians. I might also just add as a bit of a aside that there was a whole movement in early 20th century Russian culture called Scythianism which really espoused a Russian identity that was Eurasian rather than European uh, and, you know, spoke, uh, invoked the memory of the Scythian uh, culture as a, 
as a Eurasian culture based across the uh, the Great Steppe and the Taiga and uh, represented a alternative future for Russia other than a future in Europe. And in an interesting sort of way, I guess, um, Russia over the last, I don't know, 30 years has been going through a similar kind of process of, you know, wanting to join Europe and the Atlantic world and finding itself spurred and then uh, choosing to find its um, future in Eurasia as a kind of a, a multi-ethnic state in a multipolar world. Anyhow, so the Scythians are a very significant and important culture of the steppe uh, that still have objects of extraordinary beauty uh, still today.